Welcome back to module two. Um, from this point on, we're going to shift gears a little bit into focusing on chapter seven in the textbook. Now that we've gotten a little bit better sense of our earth and moon and sun system, thinking about moon phases and thinking about eclipses, we now want a larger view of the overall solar system as we start to build a better understanding of scale. This video is going to introduce us to the solar system, and the next two videos will go into details that are relevant to our curriculum goals. Now, when we think about our solar system, if we were to pack it all up in a box and label the contents, we would have one single star, that's the sun. The sun is the name of our star, and it contains 99.8% of the mass that we refer to when we are talking about the solar system. The solar system is a very small part of the larger structures that we exist within, the galaxy and the universe. Those are different terms that we're going to learn about in future weeks. But for now, our understanding of the solar system is everything that is gravitationally bound to our star, the sun. There are eight planets in our solar system, four inner planets and four outer planets. We'll get introduced to them in this video, and you've probably heard their names before. And then there are dwarf planets. We're going to talk about why that is and what they are. Um, and for those of you who harbor uh, a lasting love for Pluto, we're going to talk about what happened uh, to demote it from a planet to a dwarf planet. And then there's cosmic debris. There are terms like asteroids and comets and meteors that we do want to be able to distinguish between, and that will be the focus in a later video. All right, now when our discussion of the solar system begins, I want us to recognize that we have probably never seen a fully two-scale diagram of the solar system. Many diagrams don't try to be to scale at all. Others, like this one, are to scale in sizes relative to each other and then separately in distances relative to each other. In the bottom right of the diagram, with small tick marks, are indications of where these planets are relative to the sun uh, and just how spread out everything is in the outer solar system compared to the inner solar system. But it's hard to see everything to scale all at once, and there's going to be a linked video um, that is going to be part of our main playlist uh, that really tries to help uh, create a better understanding of scale models of the solar system for us. But if we look, um, the Sun is shown to scale, but only a small part of it. Uh, and then Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars are all right next to each other. Mercury and Venus have no moons of any kind. The Earth has one natural satellite that we call the moon. Mars has two natural satellites, Phobos and Deimos. They're both quite small um, and are almost certainly captured asteroids from the asteroid belt, which we see lies in between the inner planets and the outer planets. We then have the larger outer planets, and we're going to talk over the course of the rest of Module 2 why they got so big, with highlighted moons for each of these, because Jupiter and Saturn have over 60 moons each, Uranus and Neptune have dozens, uh, and we just don't have place to show them all. And then what I want to point out is out here at the edge of what is indicated in this diagram, in what's called the Kuiper Belt, we'll learn more about it later, are um, five named objects. Four are dwarf planets from top to bottom, Eris, Makemake, Pluto, and Haumea. And then Chiron is the moon around the dwarf planet Pluto. What is also worth recognizing is that the fifth accepted dwarf planet is Ceres in the asteroid belt. So let's talk about the idea of planets and dwarf planets and what the definition truly is. The word for planet comes from the ancient Greek for wanderer because way back in ancient Greece, back to the beginning of our history of astronomy that we talked about in module one, the ancient Greek scholars could tell that some of the bright points in the sky moved differently than the stars did. That the stars had a consistent pattern and although that shifted over the course of the year, it always came back and the pattern was the same. But there were these objects, and at the time they knew about um, five or six of them, that moved separate from the background stars and were quite bright. Venus and Jupiter are some of the brightest things in the nighttime sky once you take out uh, the sun and moon as options. 
So we didn't really have a definition for a planet beyond this kind of understanding that it's this category of things that have been known about since ancient Greece. Because we didn't really need to have a um, strict scientific definition for something that everybody understood. It took until 2006 for our technology to get strong enough and good enough that we were starting to find brand new smaller objects beyond the kind of accepted nine planets. So the International Astronomical Union sat down and figured out what do we need to, to determine the difference between planets, where they kind of had the eight planets in mind, from these smaller objects that also go around the sun and are part of our solar system. So there were several iterations of this process. I won't get into all of the details, but the official definition um, phrased into simpler words for us has three different parts. A planet has to orbit the sun. Original definitions um, were orbiting any star, but we've actually decided as an astronomy community that we're gonna have a different word for planets orbiting other stars and call those exoplanets. We'll learn all about them in several weeks time. The second piece of the definition is that the planet has to have enough mass to be round. If there's enough mass, gravi gravity is strong enough to kind of pull it into a ball. It's called uh, hydrostatic equilibrium. We don't need that fancy term. We just need to recognize that round isn't a kind of coincidence shape. It is if you have enough stuff, that is the shape you're going to have um, as a planetary body or as a um, celestial body. And then here's the important one for distinguishing a planet. The planet has to be the most massive object in its orbit. It has to have cleared its orbit of any other similar sized debris. This clearing the neighborhood of its orbit is what distinguishes planets from dwarf planets because the new category that showed up in 20, 2006 um, of dwarf planet satisfies A and B objects that are around the sun and are spherical. They're round. But Pluto is among a whole bunch of other material that is similar in size and has not cleared the orbit of its debris. And in fact, Pluto's orbit um, overlaps with Neptune's a little bit, um, although not in the third dimension. So when we look at these confirmed dwarf planets, so as of 2024, we have four confirmed dwarf planets, all labeled here. We can see that even Haumea isn't like perfectly spherical, but it's still counted. Eris was the object that was the kind of main contributor to our need to define a new, um, a new category, because it is similar in size to Pluto. It really is something that makes a lot more sense as we get into the history of the solar system and we get into the properties of these other types of planets. Um, it really does make sense to have this category of dwarf planet, of which there are dozens of additional candidates in the Kuiper Belt. We would not want to have elementary school students having to learn dozens and dozens of names just because we, we wanted to hold on to Pluto as this, as this special thing. So... Let's go through the regions of the solar system. We've started to hint at them a little bit, so let's continue with that. The inner planets are the four planets that are close to the sun, they're relatively small, and they all have solid surfaces. They're often uh, referred to as terrestrial planets, where terrestrial means Earth-like. Earth is our prime example, it's our favorite one, I hope, uh, and from uh, closest to the sun to farthest, we have Mercury, which is shown here in the bottom right, then Venus, which is kind of the sister planet to Earth, although um, much hotter and much denser atmosphere. Then we have Earth, and finally Mars, uh, the red planet that has ice caps uh, shown here on this diagram. Now, just past the inner planets is the asteroid belt. This picture here shows uh, all of the known asteroids as pixels, although those pixels are far too large um, to actually represent their size. So although it looks like a very um, busy place, if you were to actually fly through the asteroid belt, it would be very difficult to see two asteroids at any one time through your spaceship windshield. 
Asteroids are mostly rocky. They can be difficult to detect, but we've seen um, we've seen countless numbers that are all in a large database, and NASA continues to search for new ones and monitor the ones that we've found. There are different terms for um, categories of asteroids that we don't really need for our course. Uh, you can see them listed here, um, and there's a lot of interesting things uh, about those, but again, it kind of goes beyond our curriculum goals. So if you're curious, ask me about it, uh, but otherwise, we just want to recognize the asteroid belt is this big region in between Mars and Jupiter. So beyond uh, the asteroid belt are the outer four planets. These are often called giant planets. They're much bigger. Um, they are also called Jovian planets. Jovian means Jupiter-like in the same way that terrestrial means Earth-like. So Jupiter is kind of our prime example. It is the largest of the planets. It is um, 300 times more massive than the Earth and 11 times as big across. Uh, Jupiter is the closest out of the four. Saturn is next. Saturn is well known for its visible ring system. All four of these gas uh, giant planets have ring systems. Then Uranus is the lighter blue shown on the uh, screen, and Neptune is the darker blue. And this image shows Neptune's dark spot, uh, which lasted for about 30 years, but has since uh, gone away as a storm system. Jupiter's great red spot, which is fairly well known, and you may have heard about it before, uh, has been there for as long as we have observed the planet. Now beyond the outer planets is the Kuiper Belt. I mentioned this name briefly when we were talking about the dwarf planets. Uh, and this diagram shows, again, as pixels, which are way too large to actually represent their size, all of the different known Kuiper Belt objects that we're tracking. These tend to be much icier uh, in content, so some rock material, but also lots of ices. Uh, and we have flown past Pluto with the New Horizons mission, which is a Kuiper Belt object, and that mission continued and flew past another Kuiper Belt object that was named Arakoth and is shown on the left here. And it's really two objects that kind of merged together in a collision and just kind of stuck that way. So these are the main regions of the solar system that show up in most diagrams, but there's actually one more beyond the Kuiper belt, and that's the Oort cloud. All of the stuff we've been talking about so far is relatively flat, going around the sun in roughly the same uh, direction with roughly the same plane. And we will talk when we get to the last part of this module about how that really tells us about the formation history of the solar system. But there is a larger cloud of material all around the sun, which is kind of stuff that is left over or got picked up as we move through the galaxy, and that's referred to as the Oort cloud, uh, named after the uh, discoverer of this location. Now, we really don't have good ways to, to visibly see with telescopes the Oort cloud itself. Instead, we track comets as they get near the sun and we track where they have to be extending out to and that's really our better understanding of the composition and um, mass amounts in the Oort cloud and we'll be talking about comets in a later video. So for now we want to recognize that it's there and it's there out past all of the planets and it's past where our furthest human-made uh, satellite has ever gotten to. The Voyager 1 spacecraft was launched in the 1970s. It has reached the edge of the sun's kind of pressure influence, but it is nowhere close to the Oort cloud, and it will not get to the Oort cloud in our lifetimes. Such a far out location uh, that extends out about halfway to the nearest star. Now, I threw a bunch of terms at you and a bunch of objects, our planets, I do want you to take a moment and recognize that one of the things we want to try to do in this class is to have an understanding of relative sizes and scales. I don't want you to look up the diameters of any of these objects. That's not numbers worth having in our brain. But what I would likely what I would like you to do is to think about all eight of the planets that I mentioned. If you want to Rewind to make sure that you have them all. If you uh, remember them from elementary or middle school, that's great. And I want you to group them into pairs by objects that are approximately the same size as each other. So for example, Earth and Venus are very similar in size to each other. So I've already done one of the pairs for you. 
Once you've paired them up as being about the same size as each other, then I want you to put those pairs in order from smallest pair to biggest pair. So pause to take as much time as you need to do that. Okay. Now this is where we can really apply some critical thinking. We're not trying to memorize numbers. We're not even really trying to memorize the small differences between the size of Earth and Venus. But we are trying to get this overall sense of how things relate. Mercury and Mars are the other inner planets and they are the smallest ones. So we'll start with Mercury and Mars. Then Earth and Venus, which I already paired up for you, are also part of that small inner planet sizes. So they're second in the pair. And then Uranus and Neptune are each only about four times as big as the Earth. So they're a pair with each other. They both also have that bluish color. They kind of look like siblings. Uh, they're the next pair. And then Saturn and Jupiter are the, um, the largest pair. And although Jupiter is bigger than Saturn, that isn't as important to us as recognizing that Saturn is bigger than Mercury, for example. And I've made this small diagram for you to help us start to really compare these different scales. So this diagram is just a bunch of circles, but let's talk through briefly what we're looking at. The big yellow circle is the sun. All of those little black circles, there's about a hundred across, that is the earth. Each one of those small black circles is the earth, the size of it across. And then we have Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune repeated four total times because that is actually how big across the sun is. If we took all of the outer four planets, we could have four of those sets in order to get all the way across the diameter of the sun. We don't need to memorize the four either, but what we do want to recognize is that the outer planets are a scale, um, an order of magnitude bigger than the Earth. And the sun is an order of magnitude bigger than one of the outer planets. And that helps us be able to get a sense of this relative size, this estimating idea, rather than memorizing numbers. All right. Now, if you are still struggling to think about these scales or you want different ways to be able to approach um, visualizing the scale, there's a bunch of useful websites for you that I encourage you to try at least one. I love If the Moon Were Only One Pixel. It's an interactive website that scrolls at the speed of light through the solar system. Um, the NASA Solar System website is a great informational website as well. And then to scale the solar system, that video is fabulous for showing us a scale model. And the solar system tour does a great job of giving you one or two fun facts about each of the planets in a way that I think really does help connect with anything that you've learned before. So I encourage that one as well. And what I'll leave you with is this last diagram that I made with a bunch of circles, which shows that um, on average, if you take the Earth uh, compared to the moon, they are separated by about 30 Earths. So there are 30 of those black empty circles across here. And you can actually fit all the other planets into that space if you were to line them up right side by side. Um, so that also gives you a general sense of scale, that there's a lot of empty space in the solar system. All the planets could fit in between the Earth and the Moon, um, and yet there is nothing in between the Earth and the Moon, and there's a lot of empty space uh, in between each of these planets. So again, I encourage you to check out any of these resources that are linked here, and I will see you in the next video.